the Holy Land in the year 30 AD. The man who put the fear of God into the Roman Empire and helped launch the biggest religion in the world now faces his death. But he isn't Jesus. He's more popular than Jesus. His name is John the Baptist. And he is a problem. John the Baptist was a potential revolutionary figure who could have sparked a successful rebellion. John's one of the most significant yet underrated figures in the history of Christianity. One of the last mentions of John in the Bible is the moment when King Herod Antipas shows off John's severed head to guests at his birthday party. The story breaks off quite abruptly. Where did the body go? Where did it end up? Where is he buried? And in the first century, you have people alluding to the fact that someone took his body and retrieved it. It's out there to be found. Could the bones of John the Baptist, potentially the most valuable relics in all of Christianity, survive to this day? Behind the locked doors of a church in Sozopol in Bulgaria, a team of bone specialists prepare their drills to cut into the priceless relics claimed to be those of John the Baptist. This will also be tricky. This will be tricky. If these bones hold up under scrutiny, it would rank as one of the greatest finds in Christian history. It's the only way to really get an answer where you can say, well, it's very likely to be John the Baptist. We have to get a date that fits. From samples of bone powder, Thomas Hyam of the University of Oxford will attempt to put a date to the bones using radiocarbon dating. The only thing we can do is to take a, a small piece. Mm. Put the face mask yeah. on, boys, eh? DNA experts Eska Villaslev and Hannah Schroeder of the University of Copenhagen will try to reconstruct a genetic profile. We have to get a DNA profile which suggests that this person comes from the area around you know, Israel. They can't prove that it is John the Baptist, but they can show that it could be. Excavating under the ruins of one of the oldest monasteries in Europe, archaeologist Kazimir Popkonstantinov pinpoints the location of an altar, a potential jackpot of sacred artifacts. Beneath the tiles, they uncover a marble reliquary, potentially containing a priceless Christian relic, perhaps the bones or possessions of an early saint. And there's more. A few meters away from where they found the marble box, Casimir finds part of a second, smaller stone box. It could be the top or bottom of another reliquary. But it is empty. As Kazimir wipes off the dirt, he can feel that this one is engraved with an inscription. He reads the name, Saint John. Whatever is inside the larger marble box may have belonged to Saint John the Baptist. The fact that the reliquary was buried in the ground only a few hundred years after John's death is promising. If there are relics inside, it's less likely that they are forgeries since they predate the boom in the relics trade. Word spreads across Bulgaria as the country's Eastern Orthodox Church announces the public opening of the reliquary. <laughs> For the seaside town of Sozopol, just a 15-minute boat ride from the island, it's one of the biggest events since the fall of communism. As Kazimir slides off the lid, he uncovers a handful of bone fragments and a human tooth. 
Only the bones of a saint would have been kept in such an exquisite reliquary. Kazimir and the clergy suspect they really could belong to John the Baptist. It would be perhaps the oldest historical relic we have that puts us most closely in contact with the historical Jesus. To authenticate the relics, Kazimir will need to pull together a team of experts to investigate the bones. But faith doesn't always wait for science. At the church in Sozopol, the bones are already on display. The pilgrims from all over have come here to venerate the relics of John the Baptist. When people go to venerate relics, what they're looking for is to come into contact with God, to be able to physically reach out across time into the biblical story itself and to become a part of that. And in someone like John the Baptist, who's the forerunner of Jesus, the ability to take hold of that person, that's incredibly important to people. A claim of this magnitude can't go unchecked. Candida Moss, an expert in early Christian history, has heard about this remarkable find and has come to investigate. It's really amazing to be here in this small, beautiful, yet unassuming church. And here in this humble case might be the remains of one of the most important figures in the history of Christianity. And that's sort of amazing as something like being in sort of an antique store and discovering sort of hidden treasure. At the same time, right next to the bones of John the Baptist, we have what might be a fragment of the true cross. And I would be perhaps quite skeptical about that claim. With this new discovery, I want to know where do these bones come from? How old are they? Are they from the same person? There are a whole host of questions that immediately spring to mind that as a historian, I want to know the answer to. For Moss and other experts, the problem is there are already a handful of so-called heads of John the Baptist out there. In fact, at least seven different countries claim to have a piece of him. They can't all be real. Relics are incredibly valuable. And like anything of great value, of course, they're sort of susceptible to forgery and counterfeiting. So whenever you find relics, you have to be skeptical about whether or not you have the real thing. Real or fake, all sacred relics share the same destiny, to be locked up in ornate boxes and venerated for eternity. But the church in Sozopol is about to make a risky exception, exposing these bones to the scrutiny of science. To begin, Kazimir calls on his colleague, Dr. Jordan Jordanov, an expert in human anatomy. Jordan has studied over 20,000 skeletons and is known for his uncanny ability to identify them with his naked eye. The first bone out of the box he identifies as a piece of the jaw. Next, part of a leg bone. Then a wrist bone and a piece of rib. They all appear to be from the right side of the body. From the size of the bones and wear and tear on the tooth, Jordan estimates they're probably from the same individual, a man around the age of 40. This analysis will have to be verified, but it's an encouraging start for Kazimir, and it gets even better. The last bone proves to be the most valuable relic of them all, a piece of the right hand. The mystery of John the Baptist runs much deeper than his bones. Some believe his true story was buried after his death. This suspicion is rooted in a single event. 
Jesus shows up at the River Jordan to be baptized by John, Jesus isn't anyone. He just appears as just another person who's gone out to meet this figure, John the Baptist. Meeting John the Baptist is the event that changes Jesus' life and starts the whole course of Jesus' ministry. But what doesn't add up is that later New Testament writers keep changing the story about John's baptism of Jesus. The last gospel doesn't even mention it. Was John really a follower of Jesus, or was he a powerful rival? What is Jesus doing there? What is the incarnate God doing, asking a human being for help? Um, why is he getting baptized if he's without sin? What does Jesus need from John? In the Christian faith, only three birthdays are widely celebrated. Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and John the Baptist. Since Christians believe the bones of Jesus are in heaven, the remains of John the Baptist would be the next best thing. It's really easy to get swept up in the excitement that surrounds these bones. But at the same time, we can't get swept up too early. We really have a responsibility to the people here and to history itself to really use every tool at our disposal to ask whether or not these actually could be the bones. You know, we're in Bulgaria on this tiny town on the coast of the Black Sea. And the first question is, how do the bones of someone as important as John the Baptist end up here? The bones themselves are only half the story. Kazimir and Nikolai Sharankov, an expert in ancient Greek, turn to the inscription on the smaller stone box. As they decipher the entire text, it appears to be a personal message from a man named Thomas. It reads, Lord, help thy servant Thomas. Then there is damaged missing text followed by the words of St. John. But who was Thomas? Kazimir thinks he could have been a monk or wealthy patron of the church who brought the relics to the island sometime in the fourth century. Based on the inscription, Kazimir believes that Thomas was convinced he had the bones of John the Baptist in his hands. Then, Nikolai extracts another key detail from the stone, a date, June the 24th. It's possible this is the date the bones were entombed at the island's monastery. It's also John the Baptist's birthday. John the Baptist was supposed to have been born on the 24th of June. Now, that date isn't in the Bible anywhere, um, but traditionally, John the Baptist, on the basis of the Gospel of Luke, is supposed to have been born six months before Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, the mother of Jesus, Mary, goes to her cousin, Elizabeth, who is also pregnant, and when she meets Elizabeth, Elizabeth's unborn child, John the Baptist, leaps for joy in her womb. It's a touching story, but some experts think it probably never happened. Why would Luke have made it up? Luke is trying to firmly declare for us that Jesus was always the more important figure. It completely eliminates the possibility that they were ever competitors. They were never at odds with one another. Was there something about John that posed a threat to the ministry of Jesus? The problem with John, he was contemporaneous with Jesus. He had a very similar message. Both were uh, somewhat apocalyptic preachers, preaching a kind of end times. John chooses a desert life because he felt some strong sense of mission to live apart from the world that he saw, which was so corrupt and so in need of purification. Thank you. 
It is at the intersection of the desert and the River Jordan where John's vision takes shape. There is something about the edginess of water and desert that I think speaks to the edginess of John. Here on the edge is where God is, where we could imagine people touching the divine. John emerges from the desert with a clear message. Through baptism, you can repent your sins and prepare for God's retribution. It is this right that will make John one of the most famous preachers of his time. It's the 24th of June in Sozopol, the date on which John's birthday is celebrated. Church officials lead a procession through the streets to move the relics to a newly renovated church in the center of town. Thousands crowd the doorway, trying to get inside to see the sacred bones. For the devout, there is no question that these are the remains of St. John the Baptist. But Kazimir is still far from being able to provide scientific proof. The very next morning, after the high ceremony honoring the bones, a team of the best experts in Europe enters the church in Sozopol to do the unthinkable. A team of specialists is about to cut into the suspected bones of John the Baptist. Their aim is to create DNA profile and provide a date for the relics. Under the watchful eye of the priest, Kazimir negotiates exactly which part and how much of each bone can be drilled. Is it possible to basically make a small oh, yeah. cut That's to take a small piece off? Or is it not? From which one? From, for example, this one. We're just going to try and drill right through the center. We want to try and minimize any external damage to the surface of the bone if we can. But I, of course, I understand the, how precious they are, right? So. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just drill. Just drill and collect. It's the finest of lines. They have to extract just enough powder to get an accurate result in their labs. But a slight slip of the hand could shatter these brittle fragments. It's very easy to make a wrong move when a larger part breaks open. To be honest, I'm glad that's not me sitting there. <laughs> Suddenly, a hairline crack appears in one of the bones. Nice Casimir. There's a bit of a crack along here. You see this line? You see this line along here? Mm -hmm. You can avoid any further damage. Yeah, don't worry. I'm going to try very much. A little bit more, I think, and then we'll pull it quits on this one. The work is intense, so they take turns at the drill. Shall we have a go on this one? Well, not that I want to, no. Don't, don't break it. They save the most fragile bone for last. One of the problems with the teeth is that if you're pushing it too hard to get material, you know, it kind of can break. My parents are dentists, so... <laughs> <laughs> Doing it in a church really puts it into a context, right? It really shows the importance of this material to the people here, which puts additional pressure on you, I think. We are very worried that the tooth will break, so they would uh, ask you to... Five minutes, five minutes. To everyone's relief, 
They finish sampling the fragments and the bones appear untouched. The bones of John the Baptist had the potential to bring in a huge amount of revenue for this town. Sazopal is a summer resort. And in the summer, this town is vibrant and bustling and full of people. But in the winter, like now, I'm really aware of how the hotels are closed and the restaurants are boarded up. I think that we do have to ask the question, are they really interested in the remains or are they interested in what the remains can do for this town? This is what people have been doing with relics since relics first became part of Christianity. Take, for example, the story of Amiens in France. The year is 1206 AD. A crusader named Wallon de Sarton returns from the Fourth Crusade. What de Sarton brings back from Constantinople transforms this market town into a mecca for pilgrims all over Europe. begins to build one of the largest cathedrals on the continent. 20,000 people, the entire population of Amiens, can fit inside its walls. The cost is enormous, but it pays for itself many times over, thanks to the treasure stashed inside. All of this Gothic glamour came down to one thing, Anion got the skull of St. John the Baptist, served on a platter. The church plans to keep the skull locked in its case for eternity. When it comes to verifying the relic, a thousand years of venerating the skull is proof enough for them. But the story of where the skull came from begins and ends with de Sarton and the Crusades. And that seems to be the case with all the relics of John the Baptist. They all seem to surface in the medieval period when there was a boom market for relics. Counterfeiters made a killing. None of John the Baptist's relics have any record of their origin, with one possible exception, the bones found on Sveti Ivan, St. John Island. What makes these relics really unique is that they were discovered here underneath the altar of an ancient church. They were buried here only a few hundred years after the death of the historical John the Baptist. That makes it less likely that the bones were forged during this period because the real trade in relics doesn't begin for another couple of hundred years. Most of our relics could have come off the back of someone's wagon. We have to be really suspicious about them. But for these relics, we have the kind of pristine archeological context that enables us to make much bolder claims about where they come from and for whom they were important. The archaeology gives the relics a story, and the reliquaries themselves play a crucial role. At the National History Museum in the Bulgarian capital of Sofia, the scientific team starts digging into their origins. Scraping the surface of the larger box, the museum's experts collect samples of the stone. Under the microscope, they see that it's a unique type of marble possibly from one of the islands of the Aegean Sea. The team is examining the smaller reliquary with the inscription. It turns out to be made of tuff, a soft volcanic stone found in specific areas of southern Turkey. The most likely candidate is Cappadocia, 
at the crossroads between the Holy Land and Europe. Plotting it out on a map, both sources line up on trade routes to the ancient capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, Constantinople. At that time, Sozopol was a satellite town, just over 160 kilometers away from the city. It must be the most important find of relics in a century. Could be. It's absolutely beautiful. To investigate the connection with Constantinople, Kazimir and Rosina Kostova, an expert in early archaeology, take a closer look at the design of the marble reliquary. The marble is of really good quality and the surface is well polished. Mm -hmm. This uh, product is well done by very skilled uh, workers, so perhaps uh, it's coming from kind of a very, very prominent workshop. The high quality of the reliquary, the sort of time and care, attention and money that's gone into producing it, suggests that it was commissioned to contain very important relics. This was not some kind of ad hoc, on the fly kind of container. This was produced deliberately to contain something important. The person who commissioned this reliquary has a lot of money. We have to assume that we're talking about important people and if they're from Constantinople, we're talking about the center of the empire. Kazimir and Rosina think there is a good chance the bones passed through Constantinople on their way to St. John Island. But exactly how they got out of the Holy Land is harder to pin down. If these bones were exhumed from John's grave, why are they only fragments? At a hospital near Sozopol, lasers scour every detail and build a 3D image of each bone. The images are analyzed by a forensic anthropologist. The fractures suggest that someone may have broken them into pieces after John the Baptist's death, perhaps to destroy them or to distribute them to spread the power of his relics across the empire. Compared to any other relics of John the Baptist, these have a far more detailed backstory. But like a house of cards, Casimir and Rosina's theory hinges upon something far more important, the date of the bones themselves. At his lab in Oxford, Thomas Hyam, an expert in radiocarbon dating, unwraps the powder he extracted from three of the bones. He has just a few milligrams of raw material to work with to get an accurate date on the bones. If it doesn't match up with John the Baptist's death around 30 AD, the relics will have been proven to be fake. To begin, he bathes each sample in acid, which separates the datable material, the protein, from the bone. It's at this point that a lot of the samples fail because we find that they don't have enough protein remaining. The solution will run quite clear and there won't be any protein floating around inside. If this doesn't work, it'll soon become apparent. After distilling in acid for two days, Tom's first two samples fall short. There was absolutely nothing, zero, nada. Tom is down to his last bone sample when he finally gets a break. What you can see here is there's some cloudy material in the solution, and that's very encouraging to us because it tells us that it's likely that there's protein in it. This is really good news. Yeah, if that one hadn't come through, then nothing. We wouldn't have had any dating at all. The next step is the radiocarbon accelerator, where Tom now has one shot at getting a date for the bones. Will the scientific results match the Bible's portrait of John, a man who died in his 30s at the height of his ministry, a wandering prophet whose offbeat lifestyle is the talk of the Holy Land? It's precisely his eccentricity that I think accounts for his charismatic personality, his apparent unwillingness to compromise his beliefs or his message. But John's fiery nature soon gets him into trouble. 
He goes after King Herod for his adulterous marriage to Herodias, who was the wife of Herod's brother. John condemns the royal couple as an example of the immorality eating away at society. John is saying, look, there is a new reign on the horizon, a reign that is greater than Herod's reign, greater than the Roman Empire. This is an incredibly subversive message. Herod understands full well that it's but a small step to the point of an uprising. That's the reason, it would seem, that he ultimately locks John up in prison. According to the New Testament, in John's final days in prison, his thoughts turn to Jesus. He sends messages through his followers, asking Jesus if he is the true Messiah. The evangelists want us to think that while he was in prison, awaiting his death, he was thinking about Jesus as the Messiah that he had been apparently waiting for. What we can see is the evangelists working very hard to restate at every opportunity that Jesus is more important than John the Baptist. But there are inconsistencies in the New Testament, suggesting that John may have never actually believed Jesus was the Messiah. If John the Baptist said that Jesus was the Messiah, we have to wonder why he wasn't telling people. Nothing about John the Baptist's actions after he and Jesus part ways on the banks of the River Jordan suggests that he thinks that the Messiah has come. Everything suggests that Jesus was just another person that he baptized. John's imprisonment comes at the height of his ministry. King Herod Antipas has to put a stop to his activities, but he knows that killing John could make him a martyr, an even more dangerous threat. But Queen Herodias has a different agenda. She seeks revenge for John's humiliating public attack and lays a trap using her beautiful daughter, Salome, as bait. It's King Herod's birthday and his court is celebrating with an opulent feast. His wife Herodias has prepared a special surprise for Herod, a dance by her daughter Salome. taken in by Salome's performance, that he grants her any wish. She asks Herod for the one thing her mother has been waiting for, the head of John the Baptist. Ensnared in his wife's plot, Herod has no choice. He orders up John's head on a platter. It's one of the most seductive scenes in the Bible but many biblical scholars suspect its author had an ulterior motive. This sounds really familiar to ancient audiences. They heard these stories all the time of duplicitous, manipulative women, and it was a way of making Herod look bad that he could be so easily tricked into doing this. It seems more likely that Herod commanded that John the Baptist be executed because Herod was concerned about his popularity, not because his stepdaughter danced really well for him at a party. But the problem with John the Baptist outlives King Herod's rule. Herod may have commanded John's beheading, 
but afterwards, the architects of Christianity may have used his murder to their advantage. To the followers of Jesus, John may have been seen as a threat to the foundation of Christianity itself. I think from the perspectives of the evangelists, they, they really have to see John die and see him die early on in order to clear out space for the ministry of Jesus. He has been reworked by Christian tradition to keep him in his place, if you will, to ensure that no one would be able to interpret John as in any way superior to Jesus. 2,000 years later, Kazimir is attempting to resurrect John's legacy. His theory is that Thomas, the person he believes wrote the inscription, acquired the bones and carried them in the small box to the island. There, they were transferred to the larger marble box and buried under the altar. But for this theory to hold weight, the bones must fit into the smaller inscribed box. It may look just like a game of religious Tetris, but if the bones don't fit in the small case, then what we have are some anonymous bones in a larger marble reliquary and then an empty box. So this is really key. As Kazimir tries every combination, it is painfully apparent that all six of the human bones don't fit easily in the small box. This particular piece is longer than the length of the box, so it's hard to imagine that it was together with the rest. I think the fact that not all of the bones fit in the box is a problem. This does raise more questions for me Reminds me of Cinderella's glass slipper. They almost fit, but not quite. And in this case, almost isn't quite good enough. The results come as a surprise, but there is a possible explanation. This could be the top of the box. If the missing bottom half is deep enough, it could hold all the bones at once. But the uncertainty weakens his case. It complicates our ability to link all of the bones to John the Baptist concretely. This is a little bit disappointing. Moving forward, we have to really pay attention to the scientific evidence that's coming. We're going to be particularly interested in the dating of these bones and the DNA results. That's going to be really key for ascertaining what's the relationship between the individual bones to this smaller box and to the legend of John the Baptist. At Oxford, they're about to find out if they can extract the crucial date of the suspected bones of John the Baptist. Inside the radiocarbon lab, Thomas Hyam loads his one silver bullet into his revolver. His only good sample is about to be fired through a massive particle accelerator. But once he pulls the trigger, the sample will be obliterated. We basically got one shot at it. We had one sample of bone that gave us enough carbon to get a radiocarbon tape. This is it. The accelerator shoots the protein through a maze of tubes at 80 million kilometers per hour. 25 minutes later, they get the results. Okay, results, results, results. This is the date here. So that's 1,958 plus or minus 30 almost 2,000 years ago. Oh, so almost so, exactly. Yeah, right. between 5 and 75 years AD. It's just really remarkable. Yes. Right there, 30 AD, that's when John the Baptist is supposed to have died. And you can see the date fits right within that margin. It's very exciting. Yeah. If, you know, if someone had asked me beforehand, I would have bet against this. Yeah, I mean, I mean, me too, me too. If we date quite a few of these relics, and this is the first time we've ever really got anything that's like, bang on where it's supposed to be. I'm very surprised by the result. We don't have anything like this from the first century. We have been able to um, carbon date the bones of a really critically important figure in the history of Christianity. And there's a really high probability that they might actually come from that person. Dating the bones to the first century is a phenomenal result, but it isn't the last word. At the University of Copenhagen, the DNA evidence could still destroy their case. 
a lot of sequences mapped to the Y chromosome, and so the ratio suggests that all three samples came from a male individual. Okay, that's good. Okay, that's always something. The bones were found in European soil. If they're forgeries, they could easily have been exhumed from a local grave. They do indeed come from the same individual. Yeah. Like the first, After second. weeks teasing out the DNA from the highly degraded samples, Eska Vilislev and Hannah Schroeder finally get some results. There's position 188, and that's um, defining for oh, wow. haplotype J1C2. Yeah. What's the possibility that this isn't from someone from the ancient Near East? I mean, we managed to actually capture, to drag out the entire mitochondria sequence mm -hmm. from both the tooth and, and the two bones. All the mitochondria sequences fit across the different bones. It definitely fits with the idea of these bones coming from a single individual. And this mitochondria sequence is very frequent in the Near East. DNA evidence basically fits with the idea that this could be John the Baptist. I mean, mm -hmm. it's impossible to scientifically prove it is John the Baptist, but there's nothing contradicting that claim. And that's mm -hmm. very rare in these mm -hmm. cases, right? Mm -hmm. It seems likely from the DNA evidence that someone was in the Holy Land and deliberately tried to find early bones that could be those of John the Baptist. Of course, there's the possibility they just made a mistake. But it seems as if the model of forgery that we have from the medieval period, the idea of people just digging any old thing up and passing it off as a real deal, that doesn't seem to be working here. It seems as if the person who acquired these remains really thought that they belonged to John the Baptist. It's remarkable to me, given all of the scientific scrutiny, that these bones really could be from John the Baptist, or at least we haven't discovered anything that proves that they're not. These relics have the best claim to actually being the relics of John the Baptist that I've seen. The relics of St. John Island are a testament to the staying power of John. From the very moment when Jesus went to see John at the River Jordan, the course of history changed. There's something that happens at the River Jordan at the baptism that profoundly changes Jesus forever. Presumably, without having met John the Baptist and without having this experience, Jesus might not have become the religious figure that we think of him as today. But some think that baptism became a problem that the New Testament writers had to fix. Rather than simply deny it, they assimilate and recast the meaning of the baptism of Jesus as a revelatory moment in which God proclaims him as his beloved son. It's this assimilation that becomes the ingenious take that Christianity has on what to do with this otherwise embarrassing detail that Jesus was baptized by an inferior John. Throughout the four gospels, this scene is reworked again and again each time giving Jesus more and more spiritual authority. We get to the last gospel and there isn't even a baptism anymore. And in fact, John isn't even referred to as the Baptist. Rather, he just sort of sees Jesus coming on the horizon and proclaims to the world, this is the Son of God. The very last words that we hear, John says, Jesus must grow greater and I must grow less. And in fact, that is precisely what happens in history. But the New Testament writers couldn't completely bury John's dramatic influence. You have this story in which Herod, when he hears about Jesus and hears about his great deeds of power, thinks that John the Baptist has been resurrected from the dead. 2,000 years later, the discovery of the relics on St. John Island is showing just how strong John's legacy really is. Along with the bones, the hidden story of John is resurrected. Behind Jesus' rise, there was another powerful prophet who inspired him. A man whose message continues to resonate to this day.